Hello, everyone. Welcome back to class. I'm Naomi, and I work for External Relations in the School of Humanities and Sciences. Thank you for coming to this class and back to Stanford for reunion homecoming. I'd like to ask you at this time to make sure that you've turned off your cell phones so that we don't have any interruption during the lecture. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Michael Wara is an assistant professor of law and a research fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. An expert on environmental law and policy, his research focuses on climate policy and regulation, both domestically and internationally. Michael's interests also include the interaction between climate, water, and endangered species management. His current scholarship addresses the emerging global market for greenhouse gases and mechanisms for reducing emissions, especially in context of the Kyoto Protocol. Please join me in welcoming Michael Wara. Am I, am I mic'd here? Yes. So, okay, great. Well, thanks for coming. Thanks for uh, deciding to be here listening to me hopefully talking, having a conversation about these issues um, instead of out in the beautiful afternoon. Hopefully you'll have some time to do that afterwards. Um, I'm gonna talk today about what's going on in California with respect to climate change. Uh, and you may have seen the newspaper this morning, the, the Chronicle anyway, headline is cap and trade is a go. So we are yesterday, nicely timed this, this talk. Yesterday, the Air Resources Board approved, finalized the emissions trading rule uh, that will implement a cap and trade program for California in the period starting January 1, 2013, up until the end of uh, 2020. And we'll talk more about that program as, um, as, as I talk, but it's a, we're in a very interesting phase now, because of course, now that the rule has been finalized, all parties to the rulemaking can sue. And so we're gonna, I think, very quickly enter into some, some fascinating litigation around what the limits are of state action on climate change and climate change policy. Um, and that is uh, sort of the next stage in all of this, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that as, as well. Um, I don't have a clicker. Right. So um, just a famous quote from Justice Brandeis, um, one of the happy incidents of the federal system, this single courageous state may, if its citizens so choose, serve as a laboratory and try novel social and economic experiments without risk to the rest of the country. I think it's fair to argue that that is what California is doing now. We'll see whether that final clause is really true. And that's going to be, I think, the, the key issue in the, in the litigation that's coming without risk to the rest of the country. Can California isolate what it's doing to the state, at least in its economic effects um, and its, its regulatory effects? Or is it attempting to extraterritorially regulate the activities, especially of power companies in neighboring states? We'll see. Um, so today I'm going to talk um, about impacts in California of climate change, just to sort of motivate the discussion. Um, what's going on at the federal level and why I don't think it's terribly significant um, in terms of actually changing emissions, right? There's, there's a lot of law and regulation, actually not a lot of law, a lot of new regulation that's occurring at the federal level right now. EPA is busy uh, attempting to regulate stationary sources of greenhouse gases. And I'll, I'll tell you the story of that and, and why if you drill down into the detail of what's going on, the EPA activities currently at least that they've taken so far and that they appear to be willing to take aren't actually gonna change emissions very much in this country. Um, that helps to motivate what California is doing which is a much more aggressive approach to reducing um, emissions of gases that cause climate change. Uh, and we'll talk about that approach, how it differs from the federal approach. And then what's coming now, now that the rules have been finalized, 
the challenges, and, and the early challenges are going to come from two, two types of parties, the environmental justice community, which is very much opposed to what the Air Resources Board did yesterday and has um, deep concerns about the program, and from regulated industry, uh, in particular, out-of-state regulated industry. Um, and finally, I hope we can all have a conversation about why a state would choose to act alone. It's all well and good to quote Justice Brandeis and say, oh, laboratories of democracy, let's experiment. But climate change is an unusual problem in that California can certainly experiment with solutions, but the impacts, even if we reduce emissions in California, which is, I think, the eighth largest economy in the world, if it were a nation state, to zero, nothing changes in terms of the problem, right? So it's an interesting uh, policy problem to try to address at such a limited scale. Um, so what are the impacts? Um, impacts in California. This is just a, a global sense of the impacts. Uh, yellows and oranges, uh, it's a map um, of modeling output from a coupled um, atmospheric and ocean model that tells us what changes we can expect um, by mid-century. Uh, and you can see that if yellow and reds are warmer, given what we're doing, this is sort of a, a mid-range scenario, what, what, what we might expect if emissions grew moderately. In fact, they're growing much quicker than this because of changes in the developing world. Um, but um, things are going to get warmer. But that's all well and good at the global scale. It doesn't really mean anything to, say, a planner who wants to decide where to put valuable long-lived infrastructure. Uh, or uh, someone who needs to think about meeting air quality objectives or supplying water for the state. So California has done a lot of work to try to understand, to scale down, to downscale the impacts to a meaningful level for planners within the state. Uh, one of the big concerns in California, these figures, I wonder if I can turn off the board lights. One of the big concerns in California is sea level rise. See, I can never get these right. Okay. Where? I don't usually teach in this room. Oh, that's better. Thank you. Um, one of the big concerns is sea level rise, because so many people in California choose to live next to the ocean or next to the bay. So uh, there's been a real effort, a big planning effort, to try to understand <laughs> given reasonable projections, sort of mid-range projections of sea level rise, what impacts might occur? Um, and I think the best way to think about this story is uh, to, to think in terms of the 100-year storm and the annual highest tide of the year, the tide that you get in January. And the basic story is that given mid-level forecasts of sea level rise that really only include expansion of the ocean due to it getting warmer, right? Warmer things are less dense, and so the ocean gets a little bit thicker as it warms up, not due to melting of, say, Greenland or parts of Antarctica. Um, we can expect that the annual high tide that you get in January, usually, is going to look something like the 100-year storm event in California on the coast. So that's a big impact. A lot of places in the 100-year storm event, a lot of neighborhoods, a lot of valuable infrastructure like port facilities, end up underwater. And so we're going to need to think really hard about how, which facilities to invest in defending. Um, in this map, a little bit hard to see, but both uh, San Francisco and Oakland International Airports are currently sited at sea level. Very little defense in terms of uh, storm surge. So those are big, valuable pieces of infrastructure that we're going to need to think hard about in the Bay Area. But there's lots of other places as well where this is going to be a big issue. Um, so a significant impact of concern to California that might motivate action. Air quality, that actually looks worse than it does on my computer. That's a picture of downtown Los Angeles on a, um, a bad day. And you, you can see the particulates and in the air, the ozone in the air that makes it look white. Um, air quality turns out to be a big issue um, because the traditional pollutants that cause human health effects interact with 
climate change in the following way. Um, it, ozone is ozone, which is a sort of the most important uh, causes of uh, respiratory distress, air, air, air pollution related respiratory distress, is produced by the combination of a number of pollutants that are emitted into the atmosphere and then react in the presence of sunlight. That reaction happens faster when temperatures are warmer. So as the climate warms over the next century in California, just that change in average temperatures and especially the, the change in the hot, the extreme events, the hot, the hot summer days and, and the relative lack of cooling at night um, is going to undermine, is, thought, is, is likely to undermine all the progress that we've made in the last 20 years in terms of reducing ozone concentrations in especially the South Coast Air Quality Management District and the Central Valley. You know, in the Central Valley, uh, something like, in, in certain regions of the Central Valley, something like a third of children go to school with inhalers because air quality is so poor. So this is a big public health issue. So California is concerned about this, and, and this is a, unique to California, right? We have the worst air quality in the country. So this is a, a particular concern. Um, water supply is another concern. The California snowpack is the state's largest reservoir. Um, it's much bigger than any dam, um, much more important in terms of shifting the uh, timing of availability of water resources into the periods of the year where there's no rain than any of the hard infrastructure we have. And unfortunately, as the climate warms under the kind of mid-level warming scenarios, a lot of the snowpack is gonna go away, and it's gonna go away where we have built dams, i.e. in the northern Sierra, that transport water south. So the, the southern Sierra is very high and is likely to be safe because it's so high. You know, the area around Mount Whitney, for instance, there's still gonna be plenty of snow there. But the source of the water that feeds the water projects in California is really the northern Sierra. It's much lower, um, it's the area north of Lake Tahoe. And that area is likely to be very strongly affected by just even a few degrees change because the snow is at the freezing point right now. So another reason California is concerned, we're perennially short of water. We need to do better with the water that we have, but we certainly would like to avoid losing the water that we have, having it run down the streams in the winter um, rather than be stored until July of this year when it melts and, and um, flows down to reservoirs that can capture it and then transport it south. Um, finally, and this is not unimportant, well, wildfire hazard is a real concern under most um, moderate warming scenarios. And the, there's an important interaction here between land use planning and natural hazards, of course, right? If, if, if people, people like myself, don't, I, I live at the, the urban wildland interface and am subject to wildfire risks. Um, but a lot of new development in California is the same, and we see it year in and year out where there are, are significant wildfires, people are evacuated, homes are lost, structures are lost, occasionally large numbers of structures are lost. That sort of thing is likely to get much more common under um, the kind of mid-level, the, mid, the, the moderate warming scenarios that are projected. So these are the kinds of impacts that California, in particular the Energy Commission has done a lot of work developing a, a, a precise understanding of for the state, and that in turn has motivated um, action on the state, the state level. But before we get there, it's, I think it's important to talk about the federal picture because it would make sense, um, given that this is at least a global, uh, at least a global problem, um, it would make sense to address it at the national level. Uh, it, it would make sense for the US to do something about climate change and hopefully to, to successfully negotiate an international agreement that would uh, allocate responsibility for dealing with the problem amongst the community of nations. So it's important to talk about the federal picture before we think about the states and what they're doing. So this is a picture of Fran Pavley, who will, a, 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 an individual who, a personality who will kind of show up again in this talk. She's, she's really, I think an example of, of, of someone who has made a tremendous difference, um, at least in California, on this issue. Without Fran's work, probably most of this talk would not um, exist. Certainly most of the policies have been really 
thought up by her and her staff and pushed um, in the state legislature. So uh, everyone's heard of Massachusetts versus EPA probably, um, or maybe read about it when the case was decided. The basic, basic issue there was that California and a number of states sued the federal government to try to force the federal government to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from cars and trucks, from mobile sources under the Clean Air Act. And the Bush administration didn't want to. Um, and they developed a number of rationales for why they chose not to regulate um, greenhouse gases. Those rationales were challenged by the states led by California, and uh, the states won. Um, this challenge was really motivated in, in, in many respects by legislation that was passed in California, a bill called AB 1493, that set, uh, set targets um, and, and or actually placed the burden upon the Air Resources Board of setting targets for greenhouse gas tailpipe emissions limits from cars and trucks in the state. And so California, um, as a first step, asked EPA to regulate and then, um, sorry, we'll back up, and then um, asked for license to do more. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, Subsequent to Massachusetts for CPA, uh, there was a lot of, le of legislative activity on the Hill, an attempt to do something really comprehensive about climate change. Uh, this is um, Representatives Waxman and Markey, who co-wrote legislation that passed in the House, was a cap and trade bill with a renewable electricity standard with uh, the first national building energy efficiency standards. Passed in the House, died in the Senate, couldn't get 60 votes. Um, a tremendous amount of energy was put into the Waxman Markey legislation at the federal level. And when it failed, I think most people concluded, probably rightly, that comprehensive federal action um, was a non starter. Uh, that, or, or that new, rather, new, uh, new legislation that would address greenhouse gases. Um, on their own terms was a non-starter, uh, at least for the foreseeable future. Uh, in response to that, states and uh, states forged ahead and asked for um, a waiver, because of California in particular, asked for a waiver of um, to which California is uniquely allowed to request from requirements under the Clean Air Act to do more, to enact stricter standards than apply under the Clean Air Act. And the waiver was initially denied by the Bush administration for a number of reasons. Um, in particular, that California, in order to be granted a waiver, California has to show that it's uh, suffering from uniquely severe harm uh, due to the effects of whatever pollutant it wants to regulate more stringently. and. Um, the, the Bush administration argued that climate change is a global problem. Everyone's suffering from the effects of climate change, if anyone is. And therefore, there's no uniqueness to California's situation that would justify allowing it to regulate more stringently than the Clean Air Act. Um, the Obama administration saw it differently, reconsidered, granted the waiver. And you can see here, this is just a comparison of um, auto uh, fleet fuel efficiency standards, which is, was the, the particular regulation at issue um, in the California waiver request. And I think I can point. Yeah, okay. That's Japan and the EU up there. Much more efficient than the United States. There's China, more efficient than the United States. Canada, South Korea here. And then this has been the US up to the present. The Bush administration proposed more stringent regulations to break our addiction to foreign oil. And California wanted to go further. That's California right there. Um, and that was the basic structure of the request. But you could see that, at least in the international context, this is nothing extreme. Um, but of course, the politics are different here. Um, and the circumstances are different. So once. We, the taxpayer, own the auto industry. Um, the circumstances of the negotiation around these CAFE standards really changed. Um, 
And as a consequence of that, uh, this is a picture of Ray LaHood, who is the um, director of the, I don't know if he still is, at the time was director of the Department of Transportation. Um, Lisa Jackson, EPA administrator, and President Obama announcing an agreement between the auto industry and the states and um, EPA and the National uh, Highway Transportation Safety um, Administration for tough new fuel economy standards for cars that were expressed both as a function of miles per gallon and uh, CO2 emitted, grams of CO2 emitted per mile. So essentially giving the states that have been litigating since Massachusetts versus EPA what they wanted um, and really adopting the California standard as the national approach. Um, this action, the action by EPA to regulate mobile sources, cars and trucks, has triggered a cascade of additional activities under the Clean Air Act. EPA has interpreted the act um, to mean that once it regulates a particular pollutant for one class of sources, it's obligated to regulate it for others. Um, once a pollutant is subject to regulation under the act, then um, it must be regulated for, EPA must begin the process of, of regulating it uh, for all sources. And of course, the, the source that matters the most politically in the US is not cars and trucks, it's power sector. Um, and EPA has begun the process of regulating stationary sources, large power plants, um, large industrial sources of greenhouse gases under the act. But, and, and there's tremendous resistance to, to this activity, right? There, if you, anyone who's been following the, the discussions in the House and the Senate with respect to EPA over the last um, several months, I'm sure has read about bills that have been introduced to strip EPA of authority to regulate greenhouse gases. They've passed the House, so far gotten nowhere in the Senate. Bills, um, and, and they do that uh, to a more or less limited extent for some period of time, forever. Yeah, the bills, the, the language varies, but there's, there's a tremendous resistance to using the existing statutory authority to regulate power plants, basically. Um, agencies are responsive to congressional pressure, right? I mean, the other thing that Congress can do, what else can Congress do to EPA? Even if they can't, even if this, they fail to strip EPA of authority to regulate, what could they do more simply? Take the money away, exactly. And that is something an agency does not want to have happen. And EPA feels obligated, given its interpretation of the law, to regulate stationary sources. But of course, they have tremendous discretion about how they do that. And the strategy that EPA has adopted is one that is, I think, you could charitably call a light touch. Um, the, the key determination that has to be made for a stationary source is something called best available control technology. When a major source, a major power plant, decides to do a big remodel, a, a modification, or a new power plant opens, under the act, it has to install the best available control technology for each pollutant, in this case, CO2. What is backed? What is best available control technology? Well, in general, that's up to the states, subject to EPA review. And EPA has authority to stop construction in certain circumstances if it finds that the state determination of what best available control technology is, um, is, is arbitrary and capricious. Um, when you drill down to that level and say, ask yourself, what are the possibilities here? What could, what could states do? What could EPA try to force states to do in terms of forcing changes at power plants? And what is actually happening? What's actually happening is marginal at best modest increases in the efficiency of power plants, no fundamental changes in process, no um, fundamental changes in fuel type. One of the things that many in the sort of moderate, I, would, the, I don't want to call them moderate, the, well, the, the sort of moderate wing of the environmental community thought that EPA might do things like, for instance, 
require co-firing of biomass in coal-fired power plants as backed. That's what the Swedes do, the Danes, uh, the Norwegians. They have lots of coal-fired power plants, but they're very efficient and they burn a lot of trees in the mix with the coal. And because the trees are grown on plantations and just cycle, the net CO2 emissions are, are zero from that, from that part of their fuel source, fuel stream. Um, EPA hasn't required that. They haven't required uh, so-called ultra supercritical boilers, which are the most efficient but more expensive boiler. For that's the kind of a key, one of the key components in a coal-fired power plant. That's standard issue on most new Chinese coal-fired power plants at this point, because the Chinese are worried about just having enough coal. So they want efficient power plants. So they mandate state-of-the-art technologies. EPA isn't doing that. So the, the, the take home here is that um, it's not clear that this stationary source regulation, as, even as it has generated tremendous opposition, is going to do much in terms of CO2 emissions in the US, um, at least unless um, the agency and the administration changes course. And the more precedents that are set in terms of backed determinations by states, the less likely that is to happen at least in the near term. And of course, once these facilities are built uh, under the Clean Air Act, they are, um, in essence, offered in until they do another major modification, at which point they would have to sort of re-up um, this analysis. Uh, so what's different in California? I, 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 I told you that California's likely to suffer some, some somewhat unique and, and probably substantial impacts from climate change. Um, that the feds are doing something about climate change, but it's not likely to bend the curve of emissions in, in a substantial way. Um, so California has developed a set of policy approaches to, to deal with this problem, or to try to begin dealing with it. I think that's a fair assessment. What's, what's the California approach? Why is it in the paper? yesterday, and, and what are the potential um, upsides and downsides of it? So first of all, we have the fuel economy standards. That's a key pillar of California's approach. And we, I talked about them um, before, so I won't spend too much time there. And again, the, she, before I actually get into what, what California is doing, it's worth noting that not only did she write the fuel economy bill, she wrote AB 32, which is the bill that enacts a target for California's um, emissions in 2020. California has set a target, a legally binding target of hitting on a statewide level the, the greenhouse gas emissions that occurred in the state in 1990 in 2020. So that's, a, that's an ambitious target. It amounts to something like a 25% cut in emissions below what they otherwise would have been. It's a little bit tricky to make that determination at this point because of the recession, right? Emissions fell substantially because use of electric power fell during the recession and hasn't really rebounded. So it's not, there's more uncertainty about where we'll be, but, but um, certainly in the case, this is an ambitious target. Um, and there are four main policies that the state believes will get us there. One, is the, one are, are the fuel economy standards. Um, the other, this is Arnold in front of one of his flex fuel vehicles, are so-called low carbon fuel standards. These are uh, a performance standard set for uh, refiners of uh, petroleum products that sets a limit on the carbon intensity of the fuel that refiners produce. So they need to incorporate in some way um, products into their, uh, refinery, uh, their refinery inputs that have a lower uh, CO2 content than does fossil fuels. You could imagine doing that with biofuels. You could also do it with electric vehicles. Um, that would be you know, potentially an approach that might work. Um, there, there are a number of sort of a, approaches to doing this. Um, in practice, it's turned out to be a very difficult regulation to implement. And the state hoped to derive a very large reduction in emissions from it. The idea was to cut the carbon intensity of uh, 
motor fuel in California by 10% by 2020, which is a big number because mobile sources account for 40% of emissions in California. So that, if you want to do a 25% cut, that's getting you 4 or 5% of the way there. But it turns out that it's really hard to figure out what the carbon intensity of any biofuel is. There are lots of questions about land use, about how the crop that's used to make the biofuel is grown, how it's transported to the site, whether there was a forest that grew on the site where the biofuel was grown before the farm, and should, should you count in the equation the fact that you had to cut down a forest to plant a field to grow a biofuel, et cetera. And it, it, it gets to be a really contested um, discussion and, and one that doesn't have a lot of clear answers. So it's, it's not totally clear where the, the low carbon fuel standard is going, but it's, it's, it's seeming like it's unlikely to produce the level of reductions that we had hoped. Um, and then there's the renewable portfolio standard. So this is a requirement that utilities purchase a third of their electric power from renewable resources by 2020. That is ambitious. It's ambitious um, in the context of, a, uh, of the national um, setting where lots of states have RPSs, but no one is going for something like 33%. It's ambitious in terms of engineering and power system engineering. There are, there's a large group of people at Stanford who work across campus um, who are trying to figure out how on earth you integrate solar and wind resources at this level into the electricity grid without causing blackouts, without causing problems with um, maintenance of 60 hertz, right, frequency in the, in the grid. And the, the challenge here is that wind mostly blows at night. It's, it's out of phase with the demand for electricity. And wind and solar both are subject to very fast ramps in their delivery of power, so the wind can die quite suddenly. A cloud can pass over the sun, over this large uh, solar power plant, and cause output from the plant to drop. And the electric grid as a whole has to respond to that and balance that change, that fall in supply, with an increase. So the, there, there are real challenges to, to doing this. It's, it's thought to be possible, but hard, um, and probably um, involve changes both to how electric power is regulated within the state, um, the different, the, the, basically the, the market, the wholesale market for electric power, and um, as well as how the grid is actually structured, the engineering, the hard infrastructure in California. But that's, that's the target, and that um, should deliver, if, it, if we can deliver on the RPS, um, at, well, I should say there's one additional challenge, just citing stuff, right? Anyone who's worked, um, does anyone have a practice in the, in the CEQA area in the room? Okay. Well, it's, um, it is a non-trivial undertaking to cite either one of these plants or the wires that would deliver electric power from the plant to wherever there's actually demand for electricity. So this is a shot from, the, from First Solar's facility in the Mojave. Um, no one uses power in the Mojave. You have to get it to Los Angeles. And citing the transmission line from the Mojave to Los Angeles, the first line has taken, I think, eight years. And that line is already oversubscribed relative to what people want to put in in the Mojave. So, so we're going to need more transmission to a significant degree. And that's connections around it within the state and also between other states and California. Because, of course, people want to cite solar in Arizona. And there are a lot of wind turbines uh, along the Columbia River. In the, in the Bonneville um, Power Administration's um, area of control and limited transmission between Oregon and Washington and California. So, so these are important constraints that we're going to have to deal with as a state and deal with via our laws concerning environmental impacts of major projects. So this is going to be tough. This is a heavy lift, and we may not get there. Um, we'd like to, but we may not, just, just because of the time it takes to cite major facilities like power plants. Power plants like this one cited where there happen to be endangered desert tortoises running around. That actually there, there's a business now in the Mojave of rustling tortoises, finding them on these sites, and picking them up, 
moving them somewhere else to, a, to an alternative habitat location and putting them down and letting them scamper off. And when they find too many tortoises on one of these sites, they shut down construction. So that gives you a sense of the, the challenges. Um, so the solution, the solution that the Air Resources Board came up with and that the state has come up with is, is what, what Mary Nichols likes to call leave no ton behind. We're going to do all these regulations. And, and, and these are just the three big ones that I've told you about. There's a lot of, a lot of other smaller changes that are being made in, in various aspects of air regulation and, and other, other, other um, activities that, that do emit greenhouse gases in the state. Um, but they may or may not perform, right? Command and control regulations don't always form in the way that they are supposed to. And the reductions achieved are often less than hoped for, particularly in the short to medium term. So the solution that the Air Resources Board came up with was cap and trade, set a cap on statewide emissions and hand out a whole bunch of permits to emit greenhouse gases. And um, what that will, and, and require that anyone who emits a significant amount of greenhouse gases has to surrender permits that match their emissions every year. Um, what that should achieve is the goal in the statute, in Fran Pavley's statute, in AB 32. It should achieve the, the, the 2020 target because they're only going to hand out as many permits as there were emissions in 1990, which is the target. Now, of course, if the fuel economy standards and the low carbon fuel standard and the renewable portfolio standard all worked as intended, those permits will be less valuable because reductions, there won't have to be as many extra reductions. If they don't work out as intended, which I think everyone worries that they won't, if those command and control regulations don't work out as intended, then um, these permits get more valuable, but the cap is met, and the cap is met by um, individual firms making decisions, making decisions about how much carbon to emit based on its cost. If a firm has emissions of 100, 100 tons and it can reduce its emissions to 80 tons at a relatively low cost, it might a cost critically that's below the price in the market for these permits, it'll choose to do that and sell permits into the market. Because the permits are really just like any other input to its production process, right? So they're just like for a coal-fired power plant, there's coal and there are emissions allowances and you put them together and you get electric power. That's, that's the way companies start to think about these allowances. Um, and so the hope is, the hope is that California achieves its target and achieves it cost effectively. And, um, what have people heard about has anyone heard about concerns about cap and trade? Yeah, no, I think that, the, so. California doesn't admit, but the big Absolutely. The, you raised two really important concerns. Um, you know, one is, is this the right tool to get the job done? Um, a carbon tax, the, the benefit of a carbon tax is that it imposes a uniform price on emissions and firms adjust their activities relative to that price. And it provides, which, which what's really critical is price certainty, right? With these, these allowances, there's already a market trading for these allowances. Today, they're trading around $19 a ton, the, the derivative, actually, the, deriv the, the, the forward contract for delivery of an allowance in, on January 1, 2013. It's trading at, I think, $18.80 today. Um, and then it, it's fluctuating up and down, depending on the power price and a number of other factors. Um, but the price is uncertain. So firms that need to plan on long time horizons worry about these, these these programs, these cap and trade programs, and they may, they may behave suboptimally. It may be the case that they'll end up um, 
with too many allowances or, or too few allowances and, 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 and co costing society more than would a carbon tax that sets a stable price and allows firms to plan in the long term. The risk with a carbon price is we miss the target, that we, that we guess wrong about what that price should be um, in order to accomplish the statutory objective that the Air Resources Board is faced with. Um, and what about this offshoring issue? We're going to talk more about it when I get to the challenges, but the, you know, the, the, the big issue with this, the reality is California, we don't have a lot of heavy industry. Right? The, the, the people who really worry about cap and trade are folks that would like to keep the auto industry and the steel industry and the aluminum industry in the United States and not in China. Um, it's a big issue at the national level. But at the state level, we still do have some trade exposed industries that are really concerned, like cement. About half our cement is produced in California. Half of it comes from China. And it's produced in very efficient plants in China for export. So if we impose, and, and I'll just tell you, cement is a very carbon intensive industry. You have to use a lot of fuel to cook the clinker. And when you cook it, it off gases carbon dioxide. So you not only have the carbon dioxide from the fuel, you have it from the actual process emissions within the cement plant. That's a, that's a big problem for cement. They're very concerned. What the state has done is to give them for free a whole bunch of allowances, enough so that they can comply. Um, now they may choose to use those allowances to emit carbon dioxide and make cement, or they might sell them and decide to shut down anyway. So, so it doesn't really solve the problem. Another big concern with what I'll call leakage movement of emissions from California to somewhere else because of incentives created by this price on carbon comes in the electricity sector. We don't have a California grid. We have what's called the Western Interconnect. And the reality is people, certain people uh, like to say, we don't have coal plants in California. And I usually say in response to that, we have coal plants in Nevada and Arizona and Utah and on the reservation that ship their power into California. California doesn't build coal plants in California. We choose to build them elsewhere. And for a variety of reasons involving air quality. I mean, it's, it's not a totally indefensible sort of NIMBY position. Um, we have real air quality issues. But because there's wholesale trading of electricity over this Western grid, it might be the case that, say, electricity generated from wind that's now delivered to users in, say, Utah, will instead go to California, and the coal-fired power in Utah will just stay in Utah. Net change in emissions, zero. On paper change in California, quite large, because we're no longer consuming coal-fired power. So this is a real concern, and managing it and monitoring it is a, is a real concern of the rulemaking. I will say that you know, the, the folks that are designing this program are aware of this, and, and one of the, the um, I think really remarkable aspects of this rulemaking and of the staff effort on the part of ARB is the learning that they've done from the European Union, where there's a large cap and trade program that's been operating for about uh, since 2005, and from the REGI, uh, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which is an electricity only cap and trade program in 13 northeastern states, where these leakages also come up because. The REGI states are part of something called the PJM market, uh, which is a large electricity market in the eastern states. It's much larger than just the REGI states. And so leakage there is also an issue. So, so there are efforts being made to deal with this, but it's not clear that they'll work, especially as carbon prices go high. And the, the smart money has them going quite high in California at this point. So that's what California is doing. Um, what are the challenges, both from the folks to the left and the folks to the right? Um, the EJ concern, the environmental justice concern, is that this kind of trading is going to allow, this is a picture, so the, um, the, the, the red represents um, the percent of the population in a zip code uh, that are people of color. The green dots are toxic release inventory sites, sites that have to report their emissions of toxic substances under the TRI. And this is a picture of, if you aren't familiar with the map, it's, this is LA. And that big red blob in the middle 
is southeast Los Angeles. And all the green dots are on the red blob. And what that tells you is that poor people of color in LA suffered disproportionate impacts from toxic air pollution uh, relative to everyone else, really everyone else in the state. And these people are, have organized and are politically quite important, especially to the Democratic Party. Um, and so, and they're unhappy with cap and trade. They uh, have sued um, the state uh, over its failure to seriously consider other options, in particular a command and control option. Uh, and now that the final rule, they lost on that one, um, but now that the final rule has been approved, I think it's very likely that they're going to challenge the cap and trade regulation itself because ARB's response to them, attempt to respond to them, has been to say, we're going to monitor the problem. We're going to look at the EJ areas and the facilities that are emitting carbon dioxide in those areas and make sure that they're not buying lots of allowances and so emitting more pollution. Um, and if they are, then we'll do something about it. But that's about as far as ARB has gone. They have not gotten more specific than that. And as you might imagine, if you're someone who lives next to one of these facilities, that's not adequate, right? They want very specific answers as to what ARB will do if pollution goes up because of this program at these facilities. Now, I'll tell you that the empirical work, and I'm actually doing work related to this issue in Europe, but all the empirical work on cap and trade programs suggests that that is not a concern, that in fact, that does not happen. It has not happened in, due to the cap and trade program that operates in this area for um, criteria pollutants. It hasn't happened in the acid rain trading program. If there's, if there's one, actually the study in the acid rain context suggests that um, white males are the people made worse off if you, if you sort of map census um, tracks by gender and race that, that mostly people are made the same or better off under the program but that, that low-income white males are the people that suffer the most from acid rain trading, the cap-and-trade program in the, in the United States. Um, so maybe a concern. Um, I think the EJ community would argue that it should be and that the law actually has language in it, that AB 32 has statutory language that, that, needs, that requires ARB to create the maximum feasible reductions in criteria pollutants, not just um, do no harm. So we'll see what happens. I just go the wrong way. The other biggie, which we touched on a little bit, is interstate commerce. Um, so I talked about that Western interconnect and these large transactions of electricity that occur across state lines in the West. And in particular, California imports about a quarter of its electricity. This figure just shows the mix of imports um, to California and how they've changed through time. That thick bar there is coal. Coal coming into the state, coal, coal fired power coming into the state, mostly to meet the needs of the LA Department of Water and Power, the citizens of Los Angeles who have benefit from very low cost electric power because they use coal generated in Utah. So these folks are concerned that a California state program is going to undermine their business case for a very expensive coal fired power plant they built in Utah. And they've got a point, right? All of a sudden, that coal-fired power, even if it's sold somewhere else, is, gonna, is, gonna, is going to um, command a lower price because California is the big market. If you look at electricity consumption in the Western Interconnect, there's basically two big consumers, California and the tar sands. Those are the big users of electricity. Tar sands have to heat up a lot of water to cook that oil off the sand, and we, there's a lot of people in California. So um, it, is, it is almost 100% certain that the firms that are going to be impacted out of state are going to challenge this regulation as extraterritorial regulation of out-of-state activities. And that, of course, is forbidden under the Dormant Commerce Clause. We'll see how that turns out. I think the, the state has gone to great lengths to try to uh, structure the regulation in such a way that they're only regulating in-state entities. But of course, regulation of those in-state entities, the first sellers of electricity in, within California, has big impacts on out-of-state entities. So that's going to be the question, is how a court reads that fact pattern. And we don't know. Um, the other interesting question is the foreign affairs doctrine. 
under the Constitution. So this is a picture of some Amazon rainforest that's been cut down, well, some of it has, to uh, grow soybeans. Interestingly, the California program explicitly contemplates, and um, California is in the process of negotiating to buy carbon offsets from Brazil and Indonesia and Mexico to help satisfy the obligations of polluters or emitters of greenhouse gases under the act. So we're going to be buying carbon offsets from these developing countries, basically paying people not to cut down their forest. Um, now, whatever the benefits of that, whatever, the, whatever you believe about carbon offsets, it's a controversial topic for some people, um, this looks like California cutting deals with foreign governments. And states aren't supposed to do that. Um, California has gone to great lengths to characterize what they're doing as something else. We'll see how that turns out. That's likely to be an issue as well. Um, so the question, I think, that, that ultimately, though, at the end of the day, to ask about this program is why act alone? Right? Why, why do this? If the problem is global, if California emissions are a teeny piece of that global problem, and we know that uh, the rest of the United States, certainly, um, to a lesser extent, lots of other countries are going to keep, keep emitting greenhouse gases, keep causing the problem, and that the cuts we make, our 25% cut, as hard as that will be, is not going to have a big impact on the damages that we suffer from climate change. Why do this? Um, and that's a good question. Um, the, you know, the, the answer I started with is, is this laboratory of democracy idea. And I think if you talk to the folks at the Air Resource Board, Mary Nichols, she'll tell you, um, we're going to do this. We're going to have cap and trade in California. It's going to be tough cap and trade. And you know what? The sky isn't going to fall. And I can tell you, I mean, I, I've had to go and, and interact with um, the, the folks who are fundamentally opposed to cap and trade in Congress, and they'll tell you that the sky will fall if you have a trade. Cap and tax is what they like to call it, um, because tax is a four-letter word. Um, the, and, and, and so the hope is, I think in Sacramento, that the California cap and trade experience will create a new fact that will change the discussion. Unclear how that, um, how that fact will play, as, as I mentioned. California is a different state than lots of the rest of the country. We don't have a lot of coal. We don't have a lot of heavy industry. And to the extent that you do have those things, you might feel differently about the California success story if there is a success. Um, another reason that's much more parochial is that we have the clean tech industry. And I think this should not be um, underestimated as a motivation. Right? The clean tech industry outspent big oil on the proposition to kill this whole project, two to one. Tom Steyer and George Schultz were able to effectively lobby the state that this, this was important and we should do this. And I think they did that for reasons that have to do with you know, the, what, what they believe to be the long-term economic health of the state and the future long-term future of the state. But, the, but, you know, Tom Steyer also has skin in the game and the and the, the larger, you know, the larger clean tech industry is, is, is very concerned that there be some jurisdictions where there is demand for their products when they come to market in two to seven years, depending on the, the cycle. Um, and so that's a, that's a, that may be a real reason to do this. Um, if there's no renewable portfolio standard, there's no market for new solar panels that cost less and um, and are innovative in, in, in some way or another. Um, the, the final reason may be a hope that even if, even if California cannot motivate federal action in the medium term, that it may be able to motivate regional action, that regional governance can go a long way toward um, reducing U.S. carbon dioxide emissions. It's worth noting that um, before, before uh, the, the negotiations that settled all of the lawsuits around mobile source emissions were concluded, 17 states 
representing most of the population of the United States had signed on to the California waiver and were set to enforce the California greenhouse gas tailpipe standards, just as many states choose to enforce our strict mobile source emission standards um, well, for other pollutants, for things like nitrogen oxides and particulate matter. So it's certainly possible that if we demonstrate this concept in practice, other states might be interested, particularly when they don't have unemployment rates that are, you know, nine, or I guess in California it's 11.6, 11.8 now, something like that. Um, there was actually, prior to the recession, a movement to do this, something called the Western Climate Initiative, which would have brought a large number of the Western states together to do a cap and trade program jointly. That program has died. Um, that program is really no more, except for California and a number of Canadian provinces, which raises that foreign affairs problem again. If we're, if we're linking our carbon market to Quebec, are we impermissibly interfering with the president's authority to conduct foreign affairs? Quite possibly. Um, but Quebec, Ontario, BC are what we have left. WCI. I think California's hope is that if this program can get started, if it isn't killed by litigation, if it isn't killed by some sort of Enron-like you know, carbon market crisis a la 2000, 2001, which is another concern, market governance is a real concern here, that um, over time, parts of other states in the West will join. Uh, and they'll join for a number of reasons. They might join because they sell a lot of electricity in the California. They might join because governors are elected that care about climate change or legislatures. Um, or they might join because they see that California has this program. It's reducing its emissions and yet creating jobs. Right? And that's ultimately the real concern. Right? Is, this, is this a program that is going to significantly retard our recovery from a deep recession and, and grow at, or, or will we look pretty much like every other state in terms of our economic recovery and yet be reducing our emissions of this, these gases and hopefully of other pollutants as well and creating a competitive advantage globally as we develop these industries, the clean tech industry. So I think the basic, my basic take home is we don't know at this point. This is a real experiment and it's it's going to be very interesting to watch over the next couple of years as it plays out, if it's allowed to play out. So um, thanks for coming, and um, have a great weekend.